medicine men starts praying they pray to the sun mostly on everything with these bonos too this medicine boy they thank the sun when we eat doing the medicine doing they eat with the, the earth they think he's the mother that supplies the food he grows the anything that we eat. And the old Indians, the spirit talks to the people in their dreams. And a lot of times you hear birds, you know, you just hear them clear. You see, they say words. But the sun is the creator. You can't look at the sun. You know, you can't just look at it. But you can see the sun. He shows the light. He shows us the daybreak, the morning star. You have heard the voices of John and Joe Bear Medicine, who are full-blooded Pekani Blackfeet Indians. Their tribal history is alive in the stories and legends told by one generation to the next, flowing from the old to the young. This is an oral history of their people, the Blackfeet of the Montana Plains. The people making up the Blackfoot Confederacy, Pigan and Blood and Siksika, seem to have originated north and east of where they are now in northwestern Montana, southern part of Alberta. They were a hunting tribe. A flathead Indian historian and anthropologist, Darcy McNichol, grew up on the tribal land of his people, across the Rocky Mountains from the Blackfeet. He describes the environment and events that shaped the lives of the Pecani Blackfeet people. I suppose one should back away from this and, and look at what was happening in northern North America at the end of the glacial age, say, of 10,000 years ago. People had made adaptations to the north as a hunting people, living off the animals of the area, caribou, moose, had adapted weapons and tools for that hunting economy, housing, shelter. And as the ice disappeared, there was movement both northward behind the retreating ice and southward into eventually into the Great Plains. Some of these groups made adaptations in, in the Plains area and didn't move farther. The Blackfeet stayed in the Northern Plains and made their adaptations there. The grasses of the plains fed the great buffalo herds, in turn sustaining the life of the Indian. May Williamson, a Blackfeet elder and oral historian, describes what the buffalo meant to her tribal ancestors. A buffalo was their everything. It was their living. It was their home. Because they used the hides to make the teepees with, they used everything in the buffalo. They used the horns to make spoons with, to eat with. They even used the blood to make uh, a sort of a, a pudding with wild berries in it. You might wonder, when they cut all the meat off of the bones, what did they do with the bones? All right, they broke them all up in small pieces, and they boiled them, and there was a great lot of oil that came to the top and they skimmed that off and they put it in bags. Now what kind of bags would you think they put it in? When they take the paunch out of the buffalo they would peel the top skin off leaving a sort of a fleshy part of the paunch which was the stomach and they boiled and cooked and ate that but this top part they run a willow around through it and drew it up, and that was a water bag. They hung it on either side of the door to keep it cool, and they drank that for drinking water. 
using the buffalo horns as a dipper. And the head they broke open and they used the brains and in tanning the buffalo hides, they took the brains and they rubbed it all over the green buffalo hide that they had tacked out straight on the ground. And they used that and that had a tendency of making the hide soft so that when they start tanning it, it wouldn't be so tough and hard to tan. They used them as their clothes. They scraped the hair off and tanned them. And the women made dresses out of them. The men made leggings out of them and shirts. They used them as their bedding and they were very warm. It was tanned and made into a teepee. You know what a teepee is? A lodge built like that with 22 poles. And that's a trick to put one of those things up. Well, a teepee was a shelter used by people on the move. You can't hunt and stay in one place. The animals don't come around. You have to go after the animals. And the teepee was perfectly adapted to this. It was something that could be taken down very quickly, put up very quickly. And it was amazingly sturdy. When the uh, teepee poles were placed, they were braced so that they would withstand prairie winds. If you know prairie winds, that is something. They are especially dangerous for any kind of standing structure. The teepee, because of its conical shape, would spill off the wind. It wasn't a direct uh, frontal attack on the structure. It simply spilled away. By rolling up the edges of the uh, teepee, the hive, in warm weather, you get good ventilation, so the air came from the outside, went up the smoke hole. In cold weather, you put rolled it down and put uh, weight rocks or earth around the edges to keep it tight. You even close that smoke hole to a minimum, and uh, the inside is completely comfortable, regardless how cold it might be outside. So the the teepee is a remarkable architectural adaptation to the kind of environment in which it was used. Now, if you go sound asleep and you dream and a person comes to you in this dream and said, I've come to give you a power, paint your lodge this way or that way, and your lodge will be protected and you'll never have any sickness in your lodge. And I'll see that you'll always keep well and you'll have plenty. That's one of the dreams, but they have many different dreams. Architecture, environment, and vision come together. Irene Goodstrike, a Blackfeet artist living in the Rocky Mountains, recalls her ancestral land. Out at our home where we lived and grew up, well, on this big sharp hill we always called a butte, well, there's a rock bed there. And this bed is made of rocks. Well, that's where these old uh, chiefs and them would go up and they'd sleep there with their buffalo robes and things and they'd stay there till they had a dream of what was to take place. Whatever dream they had, well, that's what happened. But no one does that of late, you see. But there was always some way of a warning, we called it, from this great spirit of what to expect. They've gotten away from it, and then now there's so many white ideas and white people mingling with tribal members. I think it's just that... They're ashamed to go and do that. When they dream, well, the leader, the chief, would always know when to move camp. He'd get up and tell the people, well, we have to move today because such a thing's going to happen. Some of our enemies are going to sneak into camp and take what we have or kill some of us. And they'd get up and they'd move. Well, sure enough, enemies get there, but it would be too late. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you weren't made fun of, for example, for one thing, if you had a vision, a so-called scientific society, you know, you say you had a, a vision of something you were supposed to do and everybody would laugh you out of court, so nobody would tell these visions. Speaking of a tribal society, uh, there's no uh, fear of ridicule. In fact, uh, this was encouraged in a way of obtaining uh, wisdom and power. The whole Sundance experience is based on this notion of obtaining vision. You are respectful when this happened to you. A great deal to do with the climate in which you live, the social climate. And I, I suppose it occurred because people were receptive. Born in 1896, John Bear Medicine, as a young man, began to paint the stories of Middle Calf and Wolf Tail, his grandmother and grandfather. A member of the Blackfeet tribe, known by Wolf Tail, had a vision about the disappearance of the buffalo herds. John tells this story in his native Pekani language, with a Don Kicking Woman, his grandson, translating. This is uh, his grandpa told you this story. This is where uh, there used to be uh, all kinds of buffalo down in the sweet grass. This is after the white men came, they start killing them. This is all they do is just take just take their hide and just leave the carcass, you know, just the carcass there. He says these Indians, the Indians heard about it, and this one guy, the son gave him the power. He said, the buffalo, you know, killing them like that, is going to disappear. There'll be no more buffalo around it. They're just a few, they'll disappear. And from there, the buffalo start disappearing. He used to go hunting. And you'd see the buffaloes all over the place. And you think to himself, he says, how, how could all the buffaloes disappear? When the white men came, he still didn't think they'd disappear from this, all that herd out there. The place you look, you'd see buffalo. You're going to be eating some different kind of meat. You won't be eating the buffalo, but different kind of meat. And the buffalo is just going to gradually disappear. And what did happen, they just disappeared. Another characteristic of a, of a tribal world is that there are no specialists as such. Everyone can do what has to be done. Some do it better than others. Some are better hunters than others. Some are better buckskin makers than others. But everyone can do these things. In a hunting group especially, everybody's a hunter. Everybody's an arrow maker if that's what they depend on for weapons. The women are all preparers of food and family raisers. Back in those days, the mothers ate a lot of berries, and she ate a lot of herbs and roots that she dug during that time, and she ate a lot of meat, so she got a lot of protein. And when she began to feel like the baby was coming, she moved out of the big teepee into her grandmother's teepee, and... Uh, the old grandmother had her bed made for her. They put everything old that they could get a hold of under her. She never laid down. They had her walk and walk and walk. And when she began to dilate, she knelt down. And a woman sat in the back of her and put her arms around here and held her tight. And she knelt with her knees spread and as soon as the baby slid out they measured the little navel and they tied it with a little buckskin string and they cut it off right away some one of the other helping ladies took the baby and they'd have this soft marrow so they just rubbed that all on the baby they didn't nurse them right away about four or five days, and then they'd nurse them. But they gave them broth. They boiled this meat real soft and nice, and then they skimmed all the grease off. And then they fed the baby this with this horn spoon, little at a time, until her milk was clear, and she could nurse it from her breast. 
They fed them all ages till they just practically quit themselves. Well, each Indian name has a meaning, and that meaning is taken from the real facts of life. Whatever happened to these uh, older people that carried that name was given on to the next door. It was always a name that uh, meant something that would be a benefit to the child that it was given to. It had to be someone with honor and respect and something that happened to benefit the person. My Indian name is Good Strike, given to me by an old, old lady. Then she gave me this name because she was 90 years old then when I was born. Anything she'd done, it turned out good. So in Indian, it means every aim she's taken in life has been successful. And she wished that on to me. The child learned by, by watching, first of all, by being part of that adult world and seeing what was going on. He was a, a person from the very beginning. In fact, a cradle board had been invented. It was possible uh, for a child to go with the mother or some adult, wherever that adult went. And as soon as the child was free of the cradle board and able to move around on his own, he began, you know, doing things. But before long, the child was doing things and then was expected, as soon as he could, to help to be a member of that cooperating group, the family. He was hunting people. He was learning how to use weapons, learning how to hunt. So it was a natural process. The individual's life wasn't marked off into a rigid classifications that uh, you find in European society. Childhood, young adulthood, adulthood, and so on. Uh, the childhood in family is in a natural process that just evolves into something. By the time he's ready for adulthood, he's learned all the things you have to know about being an adult. He never thought of himself as a child as uh, opposed to two adults. An individual could go off on his own and be able to make it on his own because he knew all the things that a person had to know in that environment in order to survive. Once you make an adaptation to the North, you don't go experimenting, you know. Let a new kind of <laughs> a skin culture. <laughs> You've made it and you are content. Once you adapt to that environment, you don't go fiddling around with, uh, you know, trying something new. You might starve. They lived on wild roots, different wild berries in the summertime, they ate them fresh a great deal. And it depended on what part of the country where they gathered the different kinds of berries. Up north here, it was the gooseberries and the service berries. They were very much like blueberries. They dried those and they put them away in what we used to call a parflesh which really was an Indian suitcase made out of green buffalo hides. And you could put a lot of dried meat in those things. Now, it isn't jerky. It's dried meat and fat. And they used wild peppermint, and they, they dried it, and then they broke it up in their hands and sprinkled it all the way through to give it a flavor. And rosebuds, wild rosebuds. They ate the roots and they ate the berries. And I noticed an article that they call them rose hips. Well, they dried an awful lot of rosebud berries and they drank the juice from that. And that was good for them. My mother had all sorts of little buckskin bags of different roots that they used. Now, I myself, lost a baby and I was bleeding to death and I had four doctors and they didn't know what to do for me so my mother sent for an old Indian lady and she just drove all the white doctors out and she gave me this tea I don't know what it was but it was dark red in color and she said this will stop that hemorrhage and stop it just like that she saved my life so these doctors came back 
and I wasn't hemorrhaging, and I was feeling fine, but I was weak. And they asked her, what did you give her? She said, you don't tell me what your medicine is. I'm not going to tell you what my medicine is. When the white man first came amongst the Indian tribes, they brought a very little baking powder and probably salt and very scarce of sugar. Mother said that her mother told her that there would just be heaps of rice and things that the traders tried to give them and teach them to eat, and they wouldn't eat it, and they'd just spill it on the ground. Later on, they began to learn to eat rice, but then they began to learn to use a little salt. The early pioneer ladies showed them how. I feel that all of these diseases come from all this fancy food that we eat. Dr. James Brailing, director of the American Medical Association Department of Food and Nutrition, comments on the Indian's understanding of nutrition and nature. We almost never give people who were a lot farther back in history enough credit for being as, as wise as they were. In relation to nutrition, call them the wise men of the tribe or whatever, did have oral traditions which they handed on just as we write books we have libraries they had oral traditions and they also were very observant they were much more observant of nature than we are as uh, we're removed we're buffered from nature by our technology they were excellent what you might call first order observers and they knew what happened when certain things were done and they were able to make comparisons between seasons and between years and long periods of observation over what happened with the ingestion of certain plants and the relation of certain plants to certain kinds of soil. All this information became cultural tradition. An individual Indian may have had a better nutrient intake than an individual resident of New York City, even though the resident of New York City has available to him a wider range of nutrients and more of them than the Indian had available. Simply by exercising his options to buy a bad diet, the person in New York City may take less advantage of what's available to him. The Indian probably overall ate a better diet. I suspect large numbers of Indians may again begin to try to follow ancestral lifestyles as much as they can. Certainly they can't hunt buffalo, but they'll be able to, to eat some of the old foods and live some of the old ways. In the re religious thinking of tribes generally, there is no separation out, physical from the spiritual, as there's no separation between the animate and inanimate, but it's all part of a universe, no separation between the humankind and animals. The rest of the animal universe are part of creation, each having its proper rights. Of course, you know, all shot through all of their creation stories, or folk tales so-called, their legends. Man talks to animals, animals talk to man. In uh, Western thought, you know, this is sheer fantasy. You know, men don't talk to animals, animals don't talk to men. Man doesn't talk to the wind or to the stars. That's nonsense in uh, Western thinking. Uh, Indians have this feeling of, of, of a unity that um, man doesn't own the world, he's not master, he's part of it. There has no greater importance than a chipmunk or any other uh, creature. It just come naturally to us that the great spirit was the one that created the heavens and earth and stars, moon, and that's what we believed. The sun was the great spirit because without him, we'd have been dead. We wouldn't have had no light. We wouldn't have had no heat. And things wouldn't grow. The grass would put growing and the vegetables or whatever we thrived on, well, they wouldn't have lasted if the old sun was to go out of sight. They understood nature. They seen what nature could do for them to keep them a going that's why they protected it so 
that was something almost sacred to them because it was something that they had to have. Each time the sun turned over, the old Indian had something to either ripen or dry so that he could cultivate what he expected from that sun. Besides, he had to furnish his religious needs to the Indians. That's why they held him high. Yeah, 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 yeah